There was a lot of discussion in these panels about LLMs. And, and sort of before going and to discuss LLMs in the realm of finance, I know that um, some of you actually use LLM for operational efficiency and operational improvements. Um, and I, would, I wanted to hear um, your unique perspective, Ruben, um, about what your take on LLM is, maybe outside of the finance realm, of how you can potentially use it for you know, operational efficiency, whether it's, a, you know, whether it's a coding archive, or just efficiency within the team. Um, it'd be great to yeah, hear your thoughts. So, I mean, so I cover capital markets out of AWS, so most of my focus is on finance, but there's obviously operational uh, sort of efficiency use cases within finance and capital markets more generally, right? But even within AWS, I mean, we have, you know, if you go to Amazon.com today and you read the summary of reviews, that is a summary that's being generated by a large language model that's been fine-tuned on all of our reviews just to do review summaries, right? It's very good at that. It is no good at anything else. But, you know, it's a good example of something that's direct to consumer, which, you know, in the financial industry, you don't see that much. It's usually man in the middle for sort of compliance risk control purposes. But in, in the consumer sector, you can go direct to consumer if you have these very sort of controlled models. Um, we also have, you know, we have saved hundreds of millions of dollars and thousands of man hours by automatically upgrading from Java 7 to Java 11 to Java something else, whatever it is, right? So, so those types of tasks, again, they're sort of proven in terms of the efficiencies. Going back to finance a little bit, um, NASDAQ and others have uh, released solutions around compliance and fraud management, right? So you get a positive indication of fraud or compliance breach, and then it's a manual investigatory process that usually follows, and, and they have deployed solutions that reduces the amount of manual time it takes to investigate a case by about 50% or so, right? So lots of use cases in that area. Uh, I mean, going back to finance, you know, we're seeing a lot of interest in sort of this idea of a investment analyst, right? Sort of analyst GPT, if you will. Uh, Bridgewater has been public with some of the solutions they've come out with. They, they have a solution for sort of the miracle research where you ask a natural language question, it gets translated to, to, um, to Python code and that gets executed and data comes back visualized, right? So it's just a much faster way of essentially democratizing access to data and analytics for analysts. Uh, similar on the qualitative side, they have a system by which you can ask you know, qualitative questions and go into the data sources that Bridgewater subscribes to. And then they've also allowed you to specify a sort of chain of thought template. So not only are you asking a question about data that's you know, somewhat proprietary to Bridgewater, but you're also able to specify the reasoning path that you want the system to take when answering that question. So it actually a asks several questions of the LLM according to the reasoning path and then sort of collates the final answer in the end so that you're able to specify how you want to think about um, you know, investment problems. Um, so those are some of the examples. I think when it comes to quant, there's not so much yet, right? It's mostly sort of fundamental use cases. With the quant use cases, many of them are to do with, you know, now it's easier to train sentiment models than before, perhaps. Now it's easier to write sort of what was traditional NLP solutions for structured data extraction from unstructured text, like web scrapers. You know, they broke all the time. You had teams at hedge funds you know, 24 seven, just looking at fixing the web scrapers. Now with LLMs, the logic sits in the model. And so these LLM based web scrapers are much more resilient, right? Much more robust because the website changes a bit of whatever the format changes, the model can figure it out, right? So, so, so those, that's sort of where we are. I mean, there are also some other things I can talk about that, that are more maybe sort of the next leading edge, but uh, um, I'll give the, the word to to someone else. No, that, that's very helpful. Uh, and, and I know you also use uh, LLMs for enhancing operational efficiency. Can you maybe share how you've done that and sort of the specific tasks that the LLM does? Actually, by using a lot of Ruben's tools. Mm -hmm. um, what we try to do is to um, enhance coding efficiency. So I manage a team of developers, PMs, analysts, they're all very good at quantitative investing. Uh, however, sometimes you have new people coming in, or new teams, 
uh, that want to be onboarded onto the infrastructure. So how do we make sure that it, we don't have to reinvent the wheel and train them for six months in order to learn all the nitty gritty in all the code base, the repos that we have been developing over the last 10, 15 years? Because this is a huge amount of information here. Um, so what is interesting is that we've been making mistakes and maybe we would be doing things differently, and uh, I want to share some of that experience. Um, initially, what we thought was that um, helping people code more efficiently is very different from ingesting large amount of text. Because when you read a piece of code, it's not super uh, digestible. And the first thing that we tried is to feed these uh, LLMs a large amount of code with that much context, and the answer, as expected, came back as complete garbage. Complete hallucinations, very difficult for, the, uh, for Larry, the name of the uh, coding assistant, to understand anything. So then we thought, OK, let's cut it in chunks. And that maybe resonate with some people in the earlier uh, panel that talked about agentic uh, LLM architecture. So what is this? It means that you have a little guy, a little agent that's very good at doing something, understanding part of the infrastructure. You have another little guy that's very good and trained at doing something else. And you've got some sort of an agent on top of it that arbitrates and exchanges information in between these two in order to come up with a chain of thought, passing information between one and the other, and then coming up with uh, the, the final answer. So we started with that. Um, that didn't work very well because then you just push the problem further. Like, how do you make sure that your top agent actually does the right thing? Uh, and then we realized something else. The quality of the answer was extremely dependent upon the sophistication and the complexity of the underlying LLM model. So whether you're using an LLM with 5 billion parameters or 11 billion parameters, however gigantic these numbers are, it, it makes a real difference. Having something more complex, more rich, enables us to shortcut this thing. So currently what we're doing is to use uh, some of the AWS tools like Bedrock, for instance, which enables us to pick the LLM we want, choose the embeddings we want, have no need whatsoever to calibrate the infrastructure because AWS does it, and uh, use what we have but provide a lot of context. So it may need adding four times or six times more information when you document something when you write the code, which is a bit of a struggle for developers. But you give them lots of case studies, lots of questions, lots of answers, and that will help um, your LLM provide coordinated and good answers. And what is interesting is that it helps also, uh, the LLM then can make relations between different parts of the code. So it can use a function and then call another function within a function within a function which is exactly what we want. So trial and error, uh, but at the end of the day, I think it's such a fast moving field that we need to stay on top of, on top of this.